Chapter 9. It was almost 6.30 when I got home. The rumble was set for 7, so I was late for supper as usual. I always come in late. I forget what time it is. Dairy had cooked dinner, baked chicken and potatoes and corn, two chickens, because all three of us like eat like horses, especially dairy. But although I loved baked chicken, I could hardly swallow any. I swallowed five aspirins, though, when dairy and soda weren't looking. I do that all the time because I can't sleep very well at night. Dairy thinks I take just one, but I usually take four. I figured five would keep me going through the rumble and maybe get rid of my headache. Then I hurried to take a shower and change clothes. Me and Soda and Dairy always got spruced up before a rumble. And besides, we wanted to so show those socias we weren't trash, that we were just as good as they were. Soda, I called from the bathroom. When did you start shaving? When I was 15, he yelled back. When did Dairy? When he was 13. Why? You figuring on growing a beard for the rumble? You're funny. We ought to send you into the Reader's Digest. I hear they pay a lot for funny things. Soda laughed and went right on... Red, went right on playing poker with Steve in the living room. Derry had on a tight black t-shirt that showed every muscle on his chest and even the flat hard muscles of his stomach. I'd hate to be the so who takes a crack at him, I thought, as I pulled on a clean t-shirt and a fresh pair of jeans. I wish my t-shirt was tighter. I have a pretty good build for my size, but I'd lost a lot of weight in Windricksville and it just didn't fit right. It was a chilly night and t-shirts aren't the warmest clothes in the world, but nobody ever gets cold in a rumble and besides, jackets interfere with your swinging ability. Soda and Steve and I had put on more hair oil than was necessary, but we wanted to show that we were greasers. Tonight, we could be proud of it. Greasers may not have much, but they have a rep, that and long hair. What kind of a world is it where all I have to be proud of is a reputation for being a hood and greasy hair? I don't want to be a hood, but even if I don't steal things and mug people and get boozed up, I'm marked lousy. Why should I be proud of it? Why should I even pretend to be proud of it? Derry never went in for the long hair. His, his was short and clean all the time. I sat in the armchair in the living room, waiting for the rest of the outfit to show up. But of course, tonight, the only one the only one coming would be 2-Bit. Johnny and Dallas wouldn't show. Soda and Steve were playing cards and arguing as usual. Soda was keeping up a steady stream of wisecracks and clowning, and Steve had turned up the radio so loud that it almost broke my eardrums. Of course, everybody listens to it loud like that, but it wasn't just the best thing for headaches. You like fights, don't you, Soda? I asked suddenly. Yeah, sure, he shrugged. I like fights. How come? I don't know. He looked at me, puzzled. It's action. It's a contest, like a drag race or a dance or something. Shoot, said Steve. I want to beat those socials head in. When I get in a fight, I want to stomp the other guy good. I like it, too. How come you like fights, Derry? I asked, looking up at him as he stood behind me, leaning in the kitchen doorway. He gave me one of those looks that hide what he's thinking, but Soda piped up. He likes to show off his muscles. I'm going to show him off on you, little buddy, if you get any mouthier. I digested what Soda had said. It was the truth. Derry liked anything that took strength, like weightlifting or playing football or roofing houses, even if he was proud of being smart, too. Derry never said anything about it, but I knew he liked fights. I felt out of things. I'll fight anyone any time, but I don't like to. I don't know if you ought to be in this rumble, Pony, Derry said slowly. Oh, no, I thought in mortal fear. I've got to be in it. Right then, the most important thing in my life was helping us whip the socials. Don't let him make me stay at home now. I've got to be in it. How come? I've always come through before, ain't I? Yeah, Derry said with a proud grin. You fight real good for a kid your size, but you were in great shape before. You've lost weight, and you don't look so great, kid. You're tensed up too much. Shoot, said Soda, trying to get the ace out of his sh shoe, but without Steve seeing him. We all get tensed up before a rumble. Let him fight tonight. Skin never hurt anyone. No weapons, no danger. I'll be okay, I pleaded. I'll get a hold of a little one, okay? Well, Johnny won't be there this time. Johnny and I sometimes ganged up on one big guy, but then... Curly Shepherd won't be there either, or Dally, and we'll need every man we can get. What happened to Shepherd? I asked, remembering Tim Shepherd's kid brother, Curly, who was a tough, cool, hard as nails Tim in miniature, and I had once played chicken by holding our cigarette ends against each other's fingers. We had stood there, clenching our teeth and grimacing, with sweat pouring down our faces and the smell of burning flesh making us sick, each refusing to holler, until Tim happened to stroll by. When he saw that we were really burning holes in each other, he cracked our heads together, swearing to kill us both if we ever pulled a stunt like that again. I still have the scar on my forefinger. Curly was an average downtown hood, tough and not real bright, but I liked him. He could take anything. He's in the cooler, Steve said, kicking the ace out of so Soda's shoe, in the reformatory. Again, I thought, and said, let me fight, Derry. If it was blades or chains or something, it'd be different. Nobody ever really gets hurt in a skin rumble. Well, Derry gave in. I guess you can, but be careful, and if you get in a jam, holler and I'll come get you out. You'll know, be okay, I said wearily. How come you never worry about Soda Pop as much? I don't see you lecturing him. Man, Derry grinned and put his arm around so Soda's shoulders. This is one kid, brother, I don't have to worry about. Soda punched him in the ribs affectionately. This kiddo can use his head. Soda Pop looked down at me with mock superiority, but Derry went on. You can see he uses it for one thing, to grow hair on. He ducked at Soda's swing and took off for the door. 
Tubit stuck his head in the door just as Derry went flying out of it. Leaping as he went off the steps, Derry turned a somersault in midair, hit the ground, and bounced up before Soda could catch him. Well, Tubit said cheerfully, cocking an eyebrow, I see we are in prime condition for a rumble. Is everybody happy? Yeah, screamed Soda, as he too did a flying somersault off the steps. He flipped up to walk on his hands and then did a no-hands cartwheel across the yard to beat Derry's performance. The excitement was catching. Screeching like an Indian, Steve went running across the lawn in flying leaps, stopped suddenly, and flipped backwards. We could all do acrobatics because Derry had taken a course at the Y and then spent a whole summer teaching us everything he'd learned on the grounds that it might come in handy in a fight. It did, but it also got two-bit and so did jail once. They were doing mid-air flips down a, down a downtown sidewalk, walking on their hands and otherwise disturbing the public and police. Leave it to those two to pull something like that. With a happy whoop, I did a no-hands cartwheel off the porch steps, hit the ground, and rolled to my feet. Two-Bit followed me in a similar manner. I am a grease, sir, Soda Pop chanted. I am a JD and a hood. I blacken the name of our fair city. I beat up people. I rob gas stations. I am a menace to society. Man, do I have fun. Grease, sir. Grease, sir. Grease, sir, Steve sing-songed. Oh, victim of environment, underprivileged, rotten, no-count hood. Juvenile delinquent, you're no good, Derry shouted. Get thee hence, white trash, Tubit said in a snobbish voice. I am a soche. I am the privileged and the well-dressed. I throw beer blasts, drive fancy cars, break windows at fancy parties. And what do you do for fun? I inquired in a serious, odd voice. I jump greasers, Tubit screamed and did a cartwheel. We settled down as we walked to the lot. Tubit was the only one wearing a jacket. He had a couple of cans of beer stuffed in it. He always gets high before a rumble. Before anything else, too, come to think of it, I shook my head. I'd hate to see the day when I had to get my nerve from a can. I'd tried drinking once before. The stuff tasted awful. I got sick, had a headache, and when Derry found out, he'd grounded me for we two weeks. But that was the last time I'd ever drink. I'd seen too much of what drinking did for you at Johnny's house. Hey, two bit, I said, deciding to complete my survey. How come you like to fight? He looked at me as if I was off my nut. Shoot, everybody fights. If everybody jumped in the Arkansas River, old Tubit would be right on their heels. I had it then. Soda fought for fun, Steve for hatred, Derry for pride, and Tubit for conformity. Why do I fight, I thought, and couldn't think of any real good reason. There isn't any real good reason for fighting except self-defense. Listen, Soda, you and Ponyboy, Derry said as we strode down the street, if the fuzz show, you two beat it out of there. The rest of us can get only, the rest of us can only get jailed. You two can get sent to a boy's home. Nobody in this neighborhood's gonna call the fuzz, Steve said grimly. You know what'll happen if they did. All the same, you two blow at the first sign of trouble, you hear me? You sure don't need an amplifier, Soda said, and stuck his tongue out at the back of Derry's head. I stifled a giggle. If you want to see something funny, it's a tough hood sticking his tongue out at his big brother. Tim Shepard and company were already waiting when we arrived at the vacant lot, along with a gang from Brumley, one of the suburbs. Tim was a lean, cat-like 18-year-old who looked like a model JD you see in movies and magazines. He had the right curly black hair, smoldering dark eyes, and a long scar from temple to chin where a tramp had belted him with a broken pop bottle. He had a tough, hard look to him, and his nose had been broken twice. Like Dally's, his smile was grim and bitter. He was one of those who enjoy being a hood. The rest of his bunch were the same way. The boys from Brumley, too, young hoods who would grow up to be old hoods. I'd never thought about it before, but they just get worse as they got older, not better. I looked at Derry. He wasn't going to be any hood when he got old. He was going to get somewhere. Living the way we do would only make him more determined to get somewhere. That's why he's better than the rest of us, I thought. He's going somewhere. And I was going to be like him. I wasn't going to be... I wasn't going to live in a lousy neighborhood all my life. Tim had the tense, hungry look of an alley cat. That's what he always reminded me of, an alley cat. And he was constantly reckless. His boys ranged from 15 to 19, hard-looking characters who were used to the strict discipline Tim gave out. That was the difference between his gang and ours. They had a leader and were organized. We were just buddies who stuck together. Each man was his own leader. Maybe that was why we could whip them. Tim and the leader of the Brumley outfit moved forward to shake hands with each of us, proving that our gangs were on the same side in this fight, although most of the guys in those two outfits weren't exactly what I'd like to call my friends. When Tim got to me, he studied me, maybe remembering how his kid brother and I had played chicken. You and the quiet blackhead kid were the ones who killed that soch? Yeah, I said, pretending to be proud of it. Then I thought of Cherry and Randy and got a sick feeling in my stomach. Good going, kid. Curly always said you were a good kid. Curly's in the reformatory for the next six months. Tim grinned ruefully, probably thinking of his rough neck, hard-headed brother. He got caught breaking into a liquor store the little, and he went on to call Curly every unprintable name under the sun, in Tim's way of thinking, terms of affection. I surveyed the scene with pride. I was the youngest one there. Even Curly, if he had been there, had turned 15, so he was older than me. 
I could tell Derry realized this too, and although he was proud, I also knew he was worried. Shoot, I thought, I'll fight so good this time he won't ever worry about me again. I'll show him that someone besides Soda Pop can use his head. One of the Brumley guys waved, waved me over. We mostly stuck with our own outfits, so I was a little leery of going over to him, but I shrugged. He asked to borrow, we then lit up. That big guy with y'all, you know him pretty well? I ought to, he's my brother, I said. I couldn't honestly say yes. I knew Derry as well as he knew me, and that isn't saying a whole lot. No kid. I got a feeling he's going to be asked to start the fireworks around here. He's a pretty good bopper. He meant rumbler. Those Brumley boys have a weird vocabulary. I doubt if half of them can read a newspaper or smell, spell much more than their names, and it comes out in their speech. I mean, you take a guy that calls a rumble bop action, and you can't tell, and you can tell he isn't real educated. Yup, I said, but why him? You shrugged. Why anybody else? I looked your outfits over. Most greasers don't have real tough builds or anything. They're mostly lean and kind of panther looking in a slouchy way. This is partly because they don't eat much and partly because they're slouchy. Derry looked like he could whip anyone there. I think most of the guys were nervous because of the no weapons rule. I didn't know about the Brumley boys, but I knew Shepherd's gang were used to fighting with anything they could get their hands on. Bicycle chains, blades, pop bottles, pieces of pipe, pool sticks, or sometimes even heaters. I mean guns. I have a kind of lousy vocabulary too, if, even if I am educated. Our gang never went in for weapons. We're just not that rough. The only weapons we ever used were knives and shoot. We carried them mostly just for looks. Like two bit with his black handled switch. None of us had ever really hurt anybody or wanted to. Just Johnny and he hadn't wanted to. Hey, Curtis, Tim yelled. I jumped. Which one? I heard Soda yell back. The big one. Come on over here. The guy from Brumley looked at me. What did I tell you? I watched Derry going toward Tim and the leader of the Brumley boys. He shouldn't be here, I thought suddenly. I shouldn't be here, and Steve shouldn't be here, and Soda shouldn't be here, and Tubit shouldn't be here. We're greasers, but not hoods, and we don't belong with this bunch of future convicts. We could end up like them, I thought. We could, and the thought didn't help my headache. I went back to stand with Soda and Steve and Tubit then, because the Sochas were arriving, right on time. They came in four carloads and filed out silently. I counted 22 of them. There were 20 of us, so I figured the odds were as even as we could get them. Derry always liked to take on two at, the time, two at a time anyway. They looked like they were all cut from the same piece of cloth clean shaven with semi beetle haircuts, wearing striped or checkered shirts with light red or tan colored jackets or modest ski jackets. They could just as evil easily have been going to the movies as to the rumble. That's why people don't ever think to blame the socias and are always ready to jump on us. We look hoodie and they look decent. It could be just the other way around. Half of the hoods I know are pretty decent guys underneath all that grease. And from what I've heard, a lot of socias are just cold blooded mean, but people usually go by looks. They lined up silently facing us and we lined up facing them. I looked for Randy but didn't see him. I hoped he wasn't there. A guy with a Madras shirt stepped up. Let's get the rules straight. Nothing but our fists and the first to run loose, right? Tim flipped his beer can. Away. You savvy real good. There was an uneasy silence. Who was going to start it? Derry solved the problem. He stepped forward under the circle of light made by the street lamp. For a minute, everything looked unreal, like the scene out of a JD movie or something. Then Derry said, I'll take on anyone. He stood there, tall, broad-shouldered, his muscles taut under his t-shirt, and his eyes glittering like ice. For a second, it looked like there wasn't anyone brave enough to take him on. Then, there was a slight stir in the faceless mob of socias, and a husky blonde guy stepped forward. He looked at Derry and quietly said, Hello, Daryl. Something flickered behind Derry's eyes, and then they were ice again. Hello, Paul. I heard Soda give a kind of squeak, and I realized that the blonde was Paul Holden. He had been the best halfback on Derry's football team at high school, and he at Derry used to buddy it around all the time. He must be a junior in college by now, I thought. He was looking at Derry with an expression I couldn't quite place, but disliked. Contempt? Pity? Hate? All three? Why? Because Derry was standing there representing all of us, and maybe Paul felt only contempt and pity and hate for greasers? Derry hadn't moved a muscle or changed expression, but you could see he hated Paul now. It wasn't only jealousy. Derry had a right to be jealous. He was ashamed to be on our side, ashamed to be seen with the Brumley boys, Shepherd's gang, maybe even us. Nobody realized it but me and Soda. It didn't matter to anyone but me and Soda. That's stupid, I thought swiftly. They both come here to fight, and they're both supposed to be smarter than that. What difference does that side make? Then Paul said, I'll take you. And something like a smile crossed Derry's face. I knew Derry had thought he could take Paul any time, but that was two, two or three years ago. What if Paul was better now, I swallowed. Neither one of my brothers had ever been beaten in a fight, but I wasn't exactly itching for someone to break the record. They moved in a circle under the light, counterclockwise, eyeing each other, sizing each other up, maybe remembering old faults and wondering if they were still there. 
The rest of us waited with mounting tension. I was reminded of Jack London's books, you know, where the wolf pack waits in silence for one of two members to go down in a fight, but it was different here. The moment either one swung a punch, the rumble would be on. The silence grew heavier, and I could hear the harsh, heavy breathing of the boys around me. Still, Derry and the Soch walked slowly in a circle. Even though I could feel their hatred, they used to be buddies, I thought. They used to be friends, and now they hate each other because one has to work for a living, and the other comes from the west side. They shouldn't hate each other. I don't hate the Soches anymore. They shouldn't hate. Hold up, a familiar voice yelled. Hold it. Derry turned to see who it was, and Paul swung, a hard right to the jaw that would have felled anyone but Derry. The rumble was on. Dallas Winston ran to join us. I couldn't find a soch my size, so I took the next best size and jumped on him. Dallas was right beside me, already on top of someone. I thought you were in the hospital, I yelled, as the soch knocked me to the ground and I rolled to avoid getting kicked. I was. Dally was having a hard time because his left arm was still in bad shape. I ain't now. How, I managed to ask, as the soch I was fighting leaped on me and re rolled near Dally. Talk the nurse into it with two-bit switch. Don't you know what rumble ain't a rumble unless I'm in it? I couldn't answer because the Soch, who was heavier than I took him for, had me pinned and was slugging the sense out of me. I thought dizzily that he was going to knock out some of my teeth loose or break my nose or something, and I knew I didn't have a chance. But Derry was keeping an eye out for me. He caught that guy by the shoulder and half lifted him up before knocking him three feet with a sledgehammer blow. I decided it would be fair for me to help Dally out, since he could only use one arm. They were slugging it out, but Dallas was getting the worst of it, so I jumped on his Soch's back, pulling his hair and pounding him. He reached back and caught me by the neck and threw me over his head to the ground. Tim Shepard, who was fighting two at once, accidentally stepped on me, knocking my breath out. I was up again as soon as I got my wind and jumped right back on the soch, trying my best to strangle him. While he was prying my fingers loose, Dally knocked him backwards so that all three of us rolled to the ground, gasping, cussing, and punching. Someone kicked me hard in the ribs, and I yelped in spite of myself. Some soch had knocked out one of our bunch and was kicking me as hard as he could. But I had both arms wrapped around the other. So the other Soch's neck and refused to let go. Dally was slugging him and I hung on desperately, although that other Soch was kicking me and you'd better believe it hurt. Finally, he kicked me in the head so hard it stunned me and I lay limp, trying to clear my mind and to keep from blacking out. I could hear the racket, but only dimly through the buzzing in my ears. Numerous bruises along my back and on my face were throbbing, but I felt detached from the pain as if it wasn't really me. They're running, I heard a voice yell joyfully. Look at the dirty run! It seemed to me that the voice belonged to Tubit, but I couldn't be sure. I tried to sit up and saw that the Soches were getting in their cars and leaving. Tim Shepard was swearing blue and green because his nose was broken again, and the leader of the Brumley boys was working over one of his men because he had broken the rules and used a piece of pipe in the fighting. Steve lay doubled up and groaning about ten feet from me. We found out later he had three broken ribs. Soda Pop was beside him, talking in a low, steady voice. I did a double take when I saw Tubit. Blood was streaming down one side of his face, and one hand was busted wide open, but he was grinning happily because the Soches were running. We won, Derry announced in a tired voice. He was going to have a black eye, and there was a cut across his forehead. We beat the Soches. Dally stood beside me quiet for a minute, trying to grasp at the fact that we had really beaten the Soches. Then, grabbing my shirt, he called me to my feet. Come on, he half dragged me down the street. We're going to see Johnny. I tried to run but stumbled, and Dally impatiently shoved me along. Hurry, he was getting worse when I left. He wants to see you. I don't know how Dallas could travel so fast and hard after being knocked around and having his sore arm hurt you some more, but I tried to keep up with him. Track wasn't ever like running, like the running I did that night. I was still dizzy and had only a dim realization of where I was going and why. Dally had Buck Merrill's T-Bird parked in front of our house and we hopped into it. I sat tight as Dally roared the car down the street. We were on 10th when a siren came on behind us and I saw the reflection of the red light flashing in the windshield. Look sick, Dally commanded. I'll say I'm taking you to the hospital, which will be truth enough. I leaned against the cold, hard glass of the window and tried to look sick, which wasn't too hard, feeling the way I did right then. This, the kid, D Jally, jerked a thumb toward me. He fell over on his motorcycle and I'm taking him to the hospital. I groaned and it wasn't all faked out. I guess it looked pretty bad, too, being cut and bruised like I was. The fuzz changes tone. Is he real bad? Do you need an escort? <coughs> How would I know if he's bad or not? I ain't no doc. Yeah, we could use an escort. And as the policeman got back in his car, I heard Dally his sucker. With the siren ahead of us, we made record time getting to the hospital. All the way there, Dally kept talking and talking about something, but I was too dizzy to make it out. I was crazy, you know, that kid crazy for wanting Johnny to stay out of trouble, for not wanting him to get hard. If he'd been like me, he'd never been in this mess. If he'd got smart like me, he'd never have to run into that church. That's what you get for helping people. Editorials in the paper and a lot of trouble. You'd better wise up, Pony. You get tough like me and you don't get hurt. You look out for yourself and nothing can bunch you, can touch you. 
He said a lot more stuff, and I didn't get it all. I had the stupid feeling that Dally was out of his mind, the way he kept raving on and on, because Dallas never talked like that. But I think now I would have understood if I hadn't been sick all the time. The cop left us at the hospital as Dally pretended to help me out of the car. The minute the cop was gone, Dally let go of me so quick I almost fell. Hurry! We ran through the lobby and crowded past people into the elevator. Several people yelled at us, I think because we were pretty racked up looking, but Dally had nothing on his mind except Johnny, and I was too mixed up to know anything, but that I had to follow Dally. When we finally got to Johnny's room, the doctor stopped us. I'm sorry, boys, but he's dying. We gotta see him, Dally said, and flicked out two bits switchblade. His voice was shaking. We're gonna see him, and if you give me any static, you'll end up on your own operating table. The doctor didn't bat an eye. You can see him, but it's because you're his friends, not because of that night. Dally looked at him for a second, then put the knife back in his pocket. We both went into Johnny's room, standing there for a second, getting our breath back in heavy gulps. It was awful quiet. It was a scary quiet. I looked at Johnny, who was very still, and for a moment I thought in agony, he's dead already, we're too late. Dally swallowed, wiping the sweat off his upper lip. Johnny Cake, he said in a hoarse voice. Johnny? Johnny stirred weakly, then opened his eyes. Hey, he managed softly. We won, Dally panted. We beat the socials. We stomped him, chased him out of our territory. Johnny didn't even try to grin at him. Useless. Fighting's no good. He was awful white. Dally licked his lips nervously. They're still writing editorials about you in the paper for being a hero and all. He was talking too fast and too calmly. Yeah, they're calling you a hero now and heroize and all the greasers. We're all proud of you, buddy. Johnny's eyes glowed. Dally was proud of him. That was all Johnny had ever wanted. Pony boy. I barely heard him. I came closer and leaned over to hear what he was going to say. Stay gold, pony boy. Stay gold. The pillow seemed to sink a little, and Johnny died. You read about people looking peacefully asleep when they're dead, but they don't. Johnny just looked dead, like a candle with the flame gone. I tried to say something, but I couldn't make a sound. Dally swallowed and reached over to push Johnny's hair back. Never could keep that hair back. That's what you get for trying to help people, you little punk. That's what you get. Whirling suddenly, he slammed back against the wall. His face contracted in agony, and sweat streamed down his face. Damn it, Johnny, he begged, slamming one fist against the wall, hammering it to make it obey his will. Oh, damn it, Johnny, don't die. Please don't die. He suddenly bolted through the door and down the hall.